Welcome to the Daily Chronological Bible. My name's Hunter, and we are reading through the Bible in chronological order as a single story. And that story is all about Jesus. It is a revelation of him, and he has revealed to us the heart of the Father. Today, November the 14th, we are reading portions of Galatians chapters 3 through 6, and we'll finish in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. We're reading from the New Living Translation. This is the word of the Lord. Galatians 3, starting in verse 24. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law for our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ... You are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Galatians 3 Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spirit on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit... Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith— The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is anyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promise to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says, to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when he gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, 
then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law for our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Galatians 4. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it is with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world, and when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us, who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father! Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child, and since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that did not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You're trying to earn favor with God by obeying certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn away from me. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God, or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit that you felt? I'm sure that you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so that I could change my tone, but at this distance I don't know how else to help you. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? 
The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is like Mount Sinai in Arabia, because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But now you are being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law. Just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what did the Scripture say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. Galatians 5 So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You are running the race so well. Who's held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God. For he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who's been confusing you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. I just wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Galatians 6 Dear brothers and sisters, If another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful natures will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Yes, and now may our gracious Lord Jesus Christ give his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you for joining us at the Daily Chronological Bible. You can find the specifics of our reading plan in the One Year Chronological Bible, published by Tyndall Press. And you can find out more about our other podcasts at dailyradiobible.com, where people from all around the world come to join us in this journey through the scriptures where we allow the scriptures to point us to the God who is love, the God revealed to us fully in Jesus. Again, that website is dailyradiobible.com. Until tomorrow, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved.